واحد محلي مشان يشوفوك بس تو انتروديوس ذا بانل يو دونت ونت انتروديوس ذا بانل لا بس ما عم بفهم ابدا كيف معلش يلا طول بالك تقعد حد محلي انتروديوس ذا بانل انتروديوس ذا بانل اند يو نوت سيتا بس ما عم بفهم بيبين هونيك ويلا اه اوكي سو يو نيد تو سيت اوفر ذير ذا كاميرا ورك ساري جو Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome here to the to the West Hall and to this uh, very interesting uh, conference. I'm Joseph Bahoud, the director of the Isam Faris Institute here at AUB, and I'm very glad and honored to. Uh, moderate uh, this morning this panel, um, a panel that is in fact uh, fully uh, Beirut Urban Lab. We have four excellent speakers that will tackle, if I uh, get it well, uh, the aspects of the, the, the policy aspects of uh, reconstruction and, and uh, urban planning. Uh, we uh, are very glad to have with you in order, I think this is the order of uh, of uh, speech or intervention, uh, Mona Fawaz, so uh, probably the champion of the Beirut Urban Lab and the, the leader of the Beirut Urban Lab. Uh, she will, uh, Mona will talk about uh, the crisis and uh, the crisis and, and planning or the planning in times of, of crisis. Uh, then we'll have uh, Dr. Huwaid Al Harisi, she's also uh, from the Beirut Urban Lab. Uh, that will uh, who will tackle uh, issues of people-centered and heritage-led uh, urban recovery, followed by uh, Mona Harab from the Beirut Urban Lab also, uh, who will uh, tackle a very, for me, important question, which is uh, how to plan in, ta in failed states, and I think that Lebanon is completely corresponding to this description. And then last but not least, Ahmad Gharbi from the Beirut Urban Lab, uh, who will present some uh, aspects of mapping and visualizing uh, in times of data scarcity. Without further ado, uh, I will um, have also the role of discussant very quickly at the end of these four presentations. But without further ado, we'll start with uh, Mona uh, Fawaz. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it. It's really heartwarming to see uh, Really, the Beirut Urban Lab and all of us together's first city debate uh, finally happening. Uh, so uh, my role in this is to sort of set a first tone on what uh, the, the, the entire day will be, actually. So my four colleagues, the co-directors of the lab first this morning and then everyone else. So I'm going to be a little bit more conceptual in how I uh, frame issues. And I try to run as much as I can through the paper for however much I can, knowing that a lot of the illustration will really happen uh, during the day. So I need not tell you that uh, the intensity of the national meltdown that all of us have been living for the last uh, decade, uh, for the last two, three years, is quite unprecedented. We're hearing from the World Bank uh, one of the largest shrinking of GDP in a very short time, akin to a civil war uh, onslaught, brutal, they use, deliberate uh, depression. We're hearing 80% of the Lebanese population below poverty line, more if we include the one million refugees in the country. Um, all of this had already uh, led my uh, a colleague from the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, ironically back in April 2020, to call it the perfect storm. He at the time was referring to the fact that on top of what he was asked to comment on, the overlapping economic, financial, and health crisis, there had been at the time also COVID coming in. Little did he know that what we were seeing was really only the beginning or the tip of the iceberg. Since then, the Lebanese currency has lost about 90% of its purchasing value, uh, and uh, it, uh, things are yet to come. Worse, the Beirut port blast has left the city really devastated. A third of the city's houses were actually affected by the blast, at least, and to date we know that less than half of the population in the neighborhoods affected by the blast have actually returned home. So I will talk a little bit more about it this afternoon. So, we have really, at the national scale, a crisis of unprecedented uh, scale. 
But what do we do as planning who practice this, uh, who practice in the country in this reality? So we are a profession that, at the, at the end of the day, really prides itself to be practical, to be about doing things. We make fun of people who act like the supposedly woke, who make big orations and stands without a plan of action. We are the action people. We have a profession that wants to make change happen. And yet, very often, we find that beyond making these statements, it is very difficult for us in the local con context to act. So I wanted today to probe with you the fact, the question of can actually planning be effective in this situation? Can we be more, more than distraught citizens? So if we want to really tackle this question seriously, I think the first thing we want to do is recognize that as planners, as professional planners, or if you want the urbanists, the guys who Henri Lefebvre called the urbanists, so you have to include with us the architects, the urban designers, the journalists who celebrate our work, the universities who educate us, all of these urbanists actually are very much part and parcel of the crisis. And we have to recognize in the tradition of the dark side of planning, our responsibility in the process I'm only going to give two quick uh, points on this. The first is our really um, very strong in Lebanon relation to the making of a property landscape, which eventually commodified land. We have since uh, 1930s and uh, the first uh, planning uh, missions from France to Lebanon with uh, Danger, uh, working, uh, planners have been working in collaboration with those who were making the land registries. And since then, we have normalized representations such as the one I'm showing here, where a natural landscape can be divided, propertyed, every piece of land owned and claimed by someone very clearly. And this is what eventually generates, we know now, landscapes such as today's Beirut, where, we, uh, where land is actually held as a commodity, as a speculative commodity, where one in four apartment is actually empty in the city, held for speculative investment, and not inhabited. Um, we also uh, really played a, a very nice role in sort of uh, giving a nice allure to the financial boom of the country. So whether we talk about Beirut's historic core and its renovation, or we talk about the high-end uh, development uh, towers along Beirut's corniche, or again all the star architects who celebrated, uh, who actually participated in a so-called economic boom in the country, we have done what uh, the French would say, les paillettes, the sparkles of the financial boom. We've given it credibility. We've built an image that people associated with this, uh, with this victory. So yes, in some, we have contributed to the crisis. Although pages and pages of planning theory may flesh out in good faith post-disaster recipes or more modestly call for us to learn from the crisis, and we see this a lot in Europe, after the 2008 crisis. In fact, I think we are part of the problem and planning should consider itself in crisis. But if we are in crisis and we don't want to be what Flivberg has called a zombie institution, right? Someone who hides the mistakes they make. And instead we want to confront those mistakes and recover our profession, there needs to be more work to do. So as I recognize the culpability of planning, its implication in the making of the overlapping crisis in the tradition of the dark side of planning, I also want to think that there's something seductive about planning. It's promise that collectivities can come together and organize the ways in which they will live together, imagine, shape, occupy the future of their shared spaces, the spaces in which they will conduct their everyday life. This is an aspiration that I'm not prepared to drop, but it's also an aspiration that I share, I know, with many Beirutis. My colleague here, who are planners, would corroborate this fact. After the port blast in 2020, we were approached by residents, by journalists, by numerous relatives even saying, what should we do? How are we going to rebuild this city together? So in many ways, they had faith in us. Eventually, NGOs who thought first that they can address post-disaster recovery simply by repairing homes found out that if they don't involve residents and work towards a collective recovery, that also would not work. So gradually, they also turned around and began to ask us, how do we plan a different city? I suspect that this aspiration of planning to foster more liberal spaces 
is also what many planning theorists today are trying to do, particularly those planning theorists who work in what we call the southern turn in planning theory. Here I want to take one second to explain this because yesterday there was kind of an illusion that southern planning theory would be about the south as opposed to the north, so we're not just making a distinction actually between what happened in Paris, uh, Nantes, and uh, London versus what happens in uh, Beirut or Mumbai. When I say a southern planning theory turn, what I mean is a planning theory turn that refuses universal truths, that refuses to generalize on the basis of London, Paris, and New York what should be the reality of everywhere else. Instead, what uh, the late Vanessa Watson has called the Southern Turn, which has now been widely adopted by colleagues, is one in which we contextualize planning theory. So we theorize in comparison with the rest of the world, but from a place, from its particular history, from its particular geography, and also from the particular ways in which planning was introduced in this place and how it has materialized over time. To conceive of a practice of planning as such, I think we need to go to Simone Davoudi's definition of planning, which is that of a practice of knowing. So Davoudi tells us if we want to be serious about it, we need to do multiple forms of learning. We need to think about how, we, think, we need to think about why, we need to think about um, how to. In a certain tradition of theorizing, I think we should begin by saying that this learning, this knowing, needs to be recognized as not universal. Learning also needs to account for many forms of knowledge. We cannot simply accept the science-based objective truths. Uh, moreover, so we need to re-question what counts as knowledge, and we also need to contextualize and historicize forms of knowledge in relation to the place and in intersection with global traveling ideas, to use Healy's terms. In addition, we need to question what legitimizes the process of planning. So what uh, we need to make shifts on assumption from a universal common good upheld by some kind of matter of fact to what the feminists have taught us to call the matter of care. Finally, the conception of collectivities in whose names we practice really need to be recognized as not one society, so we're not really talking about like homogeneous one collective groups, but by societies that are bruised, that are divided, where there's a lot of infighting in Lebanon, sectarian, class, etc. If we accept all of this, we have to recognize the task as daunting. So it's not a simple, okay, yes, let's do a southern turn and now we redo the same project. Instead, I think it means we have to reinvent the profession. And we have, we have to reinvent the profession critically by reimagining what kinds of spaces we're going to be able to live in and how. The short space of this presentation, I'm just going to give three big titles. All three of them will actually be fleshed out by my colleagues later. But these, I think, are really critical to uh, recover planning. These pillars are basically thinking about legitimacy of planning, its process, and its performance. So my first pillar is a legitimacy for the planning process. To think planning otherwise is to reconsider who has custody over the planning process and how this legitimacy is built. An important contribution of the southern turn of planning theory has been to really criticize the state. So while before there was this assumption that we long to have a state and that if you don't have a state you cannot plan, the southern uh, turn in planning theory has recognized that the state can be ethnic, as in Israel or in East Europe, and we're seeing today things like this, that it can be racist, as in the United States. So we're seeing that the state is no longer this aspirational institution. At the same time, uh, planning theorists, in the, even in the Southern tradition, have typically uh, hung on to the idea that planning can only be defined as planning if it's conducted by a state. So what I want to first argue is that we really need to accept the fact that the exercise of shaping space collectively towards an imagined future may uh, involve more actors than the state, particularly in a context like ours. We've seen here, I mean, if we want to be aspirational, we can talk about Faranak Miraftab's insurgent citizenships, uh, shaping spaces. We can be more dystopic and talk about militias in Lebanon, shaping spaces. Um, either way, we know that powerful agents, including market agents, are more and more actually doing the planning. And as such, I think we need to recognize that both the state and the planners may be projects in construction and that 
To think of planning otherwise, we need to build the legitimacy of the planning process, its custodian, with the building of the plan itself. So rather than taking it a priori that we, are, we have a custodian and if we don't have this custodian, we cannot plan, I'm suggesting that we can take the exercise of building incrementally platforms of knowledge, actors who want to champion them, actors who want to intervene in them to build truths and to gradually make of this legitimacy an exercise in the making. And I'm happy to talk more about it uh, in the presentation, but I don't want to exceed my time. So I'm going to jump to the second pillar, which is to recognize planning as tactical. Ariella did a wonderful job yesterday in recognizing towards the end of the presentation that the top-down, large-scale, aspirational planning of Europe actually was no longer working and more tactical strategies needed to be put in place. I strongly believe that in contexts such as ours, for planning to be meaningful, for it to be about the shaping of spaces, we, uh, we need to recognize it as tactical. So images such as this have often been shown as uh, the tactical process of planning, but I also think images like this need to be recognized as tacti tactical exercises in planning. And here I really want to just point one important intellectual point, which is that um, when we are just talking and imagining and debating ideas as planning theorists, and that's a very strong tension between planning theory and practice, we're non-committal. So you see planning theorists who are only theorists who for many years changed their minds, and you can see people turning, I mean, I can give you big names that over like 10, 15 years just changed their mind. And it's not so consequential. As long as they're cited by many people, it's great. But when you practice, you actually commit yourself to something. You put yourself with other people, and you're forced to start something. So theorizing a practice requires us to actually get our hands dirty and commit to people that we're working with in specific contexts where the actions we do are consequential. That's where I think that this that there's something really important about going beyond the talking and the representing to actually try and enact uh, transformations in ways that build different realities and commit us as practitioners towards the making of projects. And I mean, I wish I had more time to elaborate. Uh, my third point is really, my third pillar is the performance, performative uh, practice of planning. And here I go back to an experience that's really very dear to my heart, and now behind me, the Beirut Medinati campaign back in 2016. Uh, many of you have seen or heard about the uh, great success of Beirut Medinati as a political act. For me, what was critical about the campaigning of Beirut Medinati was that it allowed us to see the political potential of planning. Planning being an exercise to actually allow people to see a pathway towards being a collectivity. So the kinds of exercises, the public performances that Beirut Medinati put together of people sitting in public spaces, debating the future of their neighborhoods, imagining possibilities, feeling suddenly that they could say we, despite differences, even if for short periods of time, the visualizations they put together really provided an activation of the political significance of living together that I think was critical to the success of the campaign, but also to a project that reinvigorates planning, less as something that can really do something and more perhaps change immediately our context and more as a performative act that builds towards a collectivity. And here I'll also point to other projects that have been done between IFI, Beirut Medinati, and the Urban Lab, such as Zone 10, where we worked a lot with uh, developing and articulating new visions uh, for the city's coast. What I love about this project is that eventually our images were stolen by everybody, used by everybody, adopted by everyone, and so they created that sense of ownership towards the city, and people who used to just shrug and say, what, the coast is private, now feel, what, the coast is private, and they really want to make a change about it. So I don't have time to talk about all the other ways in which planning can be performative, but I want to close by saying that due to the implications in the making of the overlapping crisis that contemporary societies live and that we in Lebanon experience acutely, really planning we needs to recognize itself to be in crisis. Its legitimacy and practices are questioned, and this is for a good reason. 
Yet it is possible to think of the crisis as a possible tipping point in which planning could recover its aspirational side, the promise that collectivities can come together and organize the modalities in which they will imagine, shape, and occupy shared spaces in the future. While planning cannot alter the fundamental re relations in society, that's definitely true, it still is capable of holding a space for social justice, a space that still needs to be actualized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mona. Thank you, uh, Dr. Weida. Now you will um, talk about so the, the the human factor and the heritage factor and its centrality. Uh, Mona, do you prefer to stay seated here? And, uh, I'll come sit next to you if you want this way. I'll do it. Sorry. I'll try to save us time. I may have lost us time. <laughs> you prefer to be here? Ah, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just to set up. I hope to come to life soon. <laughs> I'm going to do one more thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Mona, for um, really laying the grounds. Uh, out for me. I hope to kind of uh, follow up on some of these ideas. I'm going to talk about the Beirut Urban Labs approach to urban recovery and uh, just take you through um, how this was uh, um, kind of positioned and share with you a couple of projects to illustrate our thinking about urban recovery uh, specifically in the city of Beirut. Um, of course, um, our approach to urban recovery had roots uh, way back when we started working together in 2006 and started thinking through the reconstruction post the Israeli attacks on Lebanese cities and villages in the south and uh, came together to um, advocate for uh, doing things differently and doing things with the people and doing things through advocacy um, uh, for shared spaces, for heritage protection, for different goals that we thought um, should have been highlighted by these processes. But um, really things came together with the establishment of the Beirut Urban Lab in 2018-19, um, and urban recovery um, became one of the four major research tracks at the lab, uh, although there are many, but uh, urban recovery was one of the four um, uh, major ones and uh, started to really focus as a research track on case studies, on theorizing urban recovery, and on really reflecting on many of the sites we have been working on in Beirut and beyond, whether it's Beirut after the Civil War and the critical discourse around the reconstruction project led by Solidaire, or the 2006 post-war conditions that were generated by the Israeli attacks and the different modalities of uh, reconstruction and recovery to um, uh, post-2011 Syria and the Syrian cities scapes and uh, the best approaches to manage um, re reconstruction, recovery, particularly of historic cities. Um, there was always a parallel uh, 
way of thinking and reflecting on these uh, practices, experiences, conditions. So the lab was constantly, and its members and teams and experts who we engage on specific projects were always reflecting on um, uh, projects that they engage in and theorize and also apply theory and back and forth. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today because I want to talk about the cyclical process of positioning oneself vis-a-vis -vis the literature, um, theorizing a specific condition, applying uh, projects onto it, and then going back to reflecting. And th these are some of the publications that attempted to do that. Uh, with other scholars, of course, um, and a network of people who work on the same issues. So um, uh, the Beirut Urban Lab, as part of its trajectory, then positioned itself in relation to urban recovery. And uh, for us, urban recovery is conceived as a process. It, it's um, a process that is triggered by different types of ruptures. They're not always wars and disasters. Sometimes they're planning acts of erasure. So um, it's uh, ruptures that affect the built environment and that really um, affect the dynamics in the city's economic and social networks as well. So we therefore like to think that this it's not about a post condition, you know, although we say post post, but it's not a post condition. We think of it as an open process. Scholars have argued, like Chang, that this is an o an not ending point and it's an open process. Um, we think of it as a process that involves the, the human layer of displacement, of course, the politics, the power relations, the agencies of change that get involved in these recovery processes. So um, we uh, have been aiming to think that any intervention in a post-disaster or post-trauma condition has to deal with the vulnerabilities that has accumulated over time and has to really build on an imagined future. So um, our aim is therefore to operate within a framework that is bottom-up, that is socially just and inclusive. Uh, how do we do that? We do it through projects that are people-centered, heritage-led, and place-specific. And I'm going to illustrate with two projects today how we do that. But this position was really, once crafted with the 2019 establishment of the lab, it was thrown into the city debate cycle. We designed a city debate um, uh, conference that was about reconceptualizing recovery. We presented our position to a whole number of scholars who engage with post-blast, post-disaster, with displacement, with refugee studies, to debate with them that position and to learn uh, from them as well. And this was also published in a book entitled Urban Recovery, Intersecting Displacement with a Post-War Reconstruction. Our position then was clear. Having published a book in 2010, coming to this book, it's about shifting from reconstruction to recovery as a holistic construct as a construct that's socioeconomic, environmental, as much as it is spatial and architectural. Um, and how do you arrive at that? What are the frameworks that allow you to intervene within such a, a position that it will be um, the answer that I'm going to share with you, or the experimentation, rather, to this. Little did we know that after that city debates, Beirut was again traumatized by the Beirut port blast on August 4th, and we were all, uh, of course, left uh, in awe of that event and had to mobilize, consolidate again as a lab, and converge on this very important moment in Beirut's history uh, and uh, having been struck by another trauma. Of course, people all mobilize to do different things, whether it's uh, social groups, NGOs, international NGOs. But again, it's not what we wanted to do. The whole lab converged again, like we did in 2006 uh, at this moment. But we wanted to deal with the long term, not with the emergency or humanitarian short term aid. We wanted to think long term, although that was frustrating because long term needs funding, needs thinking, needs reflection, needs a network of people to work with. And we did that. We applied for a grant from IDRC that allowed us to consolidate our efforts and to work under one umbrella. 
uh, along three tracks, the observatory of the reconstruction, the neighborhood scale urban recovery, which I'm going to share with you today, and visioning the city at large. So um, it was a very important moment, again, for us to test our position, to reflect on it, to try it out, and see how interventions can be informed by that position and can, again, inform that position in a future um, scenario. So I'm going to share two projects that put that position to test and had completely different assignments and completely different approaches. I'm going to share with you the Carantina Neighborhood Scale Urban Recovery Project uh, in which we adopted the participatory approach and in which we were seeking an alternative to the idea of a master plan. Again, to follow up on last night's keynote and on Mona's um, presentation, what is the alternative to these rigid, top-heavy uh, master plans? Um, and the second one is the UNESCO project uh, for the identification of modern heritage in the Beirut blast areas. And here we adopted the HAL project, Historic Urban Landscapes project, and the, we were seeking an alternative to the archaeologically ridden uh, object or artifact-centered approach to heritage. So um, I'm going to take you through these, and I hope uh, I don't go over time. Uh, that's why I'm going to go quickly. So <laughs> the first one is the neighborhood uh, scale urban recovery. For that project, we were focused on Carantina. As you know, Carantina is already a site of multiple traumas. It was uh, first established as a quarantine and was since then uh, stigmatized by that as part of its ethos. It was a site of multiple refugees, um, Armenian refugees, Palestinian refugees, Syrian refugees. It is a low-income uh, neighborhood uh, with a lot of uh, industrial uh, services, port-related services. So again, when you deal with post-blast recovery, you're talking about this accumulation of history, but accumulation of vulnerabilities uh, that have uh, existed over a, a time trajectory. So in Carantina, it was equally hit like the other neighborhoods. People lost their houses. There was also displacement. There were evictions. And um, uh, much change had taken place by the time we came in there, although we jumped in in August. Uh, things were moving really fast. We tried to, again, uh, recognize our own position and aim for that people-centered participatory um, approach and uh, took it from there. And uh, I will explain how each of these interventions need an entry point, right? Even if you're going to think a large framework. Our entry point was shared a network of public spaces. Um, so when we went to Carantina, it was very important to think, what is that alternative to the master plan? So the methodology we used is an experimental methodology that combined the CDS, which is City Development Strategy. This is something that um, emerged from a new European tradition of sustainable city strategies as an alternative, because they are participatory, because they are incremental and can happen over time, but we combined it with, of course, adapted it, and combined it with the citizen scientist training, training local researchers who work with us on data collection, on intervention designs, on um, uh, interfacing with people, and so on. The CDS is a five-step strategy for those who don't know it. It starts with profiling the place, uh, uh, extracting the strategic uh, transversal issues, conducting diagnosis, then designing the strategic framework with action plans and monitoring systems. Now, the action plans are soft and hard, spatial, and about empowerment, about policy. So you can have a list of action plans that may be about building a community space or maybe about a project for women empowerment. So we have to think that these are a bunch of projects that have a common shared vision that we extract from community meetings. So we opted for this methodology precisely because it is incremental and participatory, and we thought this is the alternative in a site where the state is absent, where there is no gen general policy, where the NGOs are um, limited in their uh, outreach, and where funding now even worse than 2006. With 2006, there was no state, but there was funding coming in. 
Uh, here in this case, the funding was also uh, uh, limited because countries did not want to send funding through the Lebanese government. So with the CS training, we formed the first point of community engagement, um, and we trained the citizens from this area, 12 of them, and they started engaging with the projects and conducting the field work towards the diagnosis of the five transversal issues that have to do with affordable housing, connectivity of Carantina, its vitality, um, uh, sustainable development, and environmental quality. Of course, all these projects are evidence-based. They rely a lot on disciplinary data collection. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, they are also heavily involved with the people. Community engagement in this project came in different forms through town hall meetings, such as this one in which you craft the vision, the shared vision by the community around which we designed the strategic framework, but also through focused, thematic focused groups in which we um, uh, go into diagnosis of the special um, uh, subjects. Um, at the same time, you always need an entry point. Because our project is long term, uh, people get impatient, right? And people who get engaged with you for a year, they want to see results. So what we try to do, and this is again all experimental, is pull one action plan which is an entry point, and it's community spaces in Carantina, because again, recovery for me is connecting people back to the place. So uh, using public spaces or community spaces as an entry point was really important to have in parallel with designing the strategic framework, which may take two, three years, matching with donors, etc. So we. Um, conducted in parallel a study of the open spaces. Of course, it's informed by the socio-spatial practices of the people. Of course, the local researchers um, helped us identify these spaces. And we conducted co-design workshops with the communities to see how these community spaces should be designed, rehabilitated, and should be part of sustaining the socio-spatial practices rather than shifting them. Right? So they are um, uh, worked with them through multiple iterations and even involved them in the making of these spaces. So the contractors who were hired to implement were asked to hire people from the neighborhood itself. So they were engaged at the intellectual envisioning level, at the data collection level, at the thematic focus groups level, and, and the implementation. So uh, we are, of course, still working in Carantina. It is by no means finished, but um, this is again a space of reflection to compare it with the other projects that we were involved in, which is um, the more heritage-led than people-centered one, if I want to distinguish the two entry points. This was a UNESCO commissioned project. But they came to BUL, approached us to really study and document and identify modern heritage in the blast area. Now, this is a very pioneering study from the UNESCO side and BUL because it's the first time in um, Lebanon where you identify, document modern heritage and landscape at the same time to look at historic urban scapes. So that's why I said we, we were approaching this project as a hull approach, the historic urban landscapes, because again, each site has a depth of history and trajectory, and you cannot just go into a post condition and restore what was before the blast. It's about really understanding the multi-layered narrative of the place to recover that and to continue it into the future rather than just simply go back to a point in time. So the limitations, as you see on the map, um, is most of the neighborhoods except for Carantina and part of the port. So we went in there and again put a framework in place because that helps kind of you know stage the work and engage with it. The framework was um, about modern heritage, about how do you understand it, uh, do the periodization, understand its attributes and values, designate it, and then um, recommend how to protect it and activate it. So it's really here, uh, I'm still reflecting on that. It's about heritage recovery. And how is heritage recovery different from you know, post-disaster urban recovery? These are the points of, of reflection that we need. So although we adopted the same position, um, which is uh, high level, Again, the entry point here was not the shared common 
community spaces, but was rather the shared heritage. But again, it's about con reconnecting people to place and having them take ownership of uh, their past, therefore enable them to decide on their future. So again, it's uh, the same idea of reaching to understanding the historic depth of the place. If we're talking about urban heritage, we have to talk about understand the city's dynamics. Um, and here, of course, I'm talking on behalf of many of my colleagues. Uh, some of them are in this room, like Robert and Serge, who really helped out in making this a pioneering study, along with Jala Makhzoumi and Hana Alameddin and Habib Dibis. Uh, to also understand its trajectory of growth as a landscape, from farmlands to uh, uh, gardens, residential gardens, what kind of urban landscape? Uh, how do you periodize that in relation to understanding modern and modernization in, a, in the context of Lebanon, not in the context of the West? And how do, what values and attributes you're looking for? So again, here we try to move away from the understanding of the physical to the social and economic. And with landscape, we even went into the environmental. So the green spaces and the shared spaces have also an environmental attributes and values thinking heritage recovery. Of course, um, for me, uh, because I am an urban heritage expert, it was very important to think of heritage as a social construct to not just think of the important iconic buildings and spaces, but to think what people consider as part of their heritage, whether it's a small grocery store at the corner where they narrate histories from their parents and grandparents, uh, whether they are sites of development that are important for their projected future. Um, so when we surveyed, we did survey the buildings and the spaces, as you see, and we did map them to understand the dynamics. So the kind of evidence-based research was always there as a backbone, whether it was in Carantina or in the blast areas that we were uh, documenting as mo sites of modern uh, landscapes. Uh, we interviewed people, we talked to them, we asked them what uh, they consider as part of their heritage. We um, mapped what they thought were landmarks in the landscape, the historic landscape in which they lived. We did the same with landscape spaces, green spaces. We looked at them um, as spaces, as trees, but also as socio-spatial practices where people sit, gather, and so on. Uh, we also took what we called urban walks with the commu community members. Again, we worked with citizen scientists, local researchers, and uh, we asked them to take us on walks, and we didn't say much. We just heard them out, what was important for them, what routes they took, w what spaces they pointed out, and so on. So this is, again, part of uh, our consistency in trying to, do, to build a bottom-up understanding of that historic urban landscape. Yes, there is the disciplinary analysis and understanding of the urban history and the trajectory and the evidence-based work, but there was always uh, an ear open to what the people perceived and conceived as their heritage and spaces of gathering. We um, decided that it was very important for uh, designating uh, these modern landscapes, but also to read them as clusters, to read them as uh, uh, clusters of built and landscape, but also clusters that I'm sharing with you here, and I'll share one, that are also community clusters, right, um, where families uh, have relationships, where different uh, communities have uh, commercial uh, uh, interconnectedness. So we wanted to think of these clusters as built landscape socioeconomic clusters. Uh, Jala would like to even say environmental. And we're hoping that this is something that we can hand over to the next phase of the UNESCO study so that when you think regulatory and protection rules, you think of all of these uh, complex uh, layers that are socioeconomic, spatial, and built and landscape all at the same time. So I will conclude, as I'm being told, by saying that really um, uh, the, the Urban Lab uh, in engaging in these projects is going through the cyclical um, uh, cycle of theorizing, positioning, 
um, experimenting and then reflecting on the works that are done, I would like to think like urban recovery, we are dealing with an open-ended process uh, that is not really about the truth, but that's about adapting models and experimenting from within, from the bottom up, not to deny the importance of the engagement of um, the top down. This is what we're learning now. I argued so much bottom up, now I'm realizing you need both. The second point is that although projects and people um, are people-centered and heritage-led, the entry point is always different from one side to the other. The entry point may be a, a community group, maybe a space, maybe heritage, uh, as long as you find the entry point to a comprehensive holistic framework, that is really the lesson I want to leave with all of us today. The third and last point is that the most important is the shared entry point. If this entry point is not shared, you're not going to work towards an inclusive uh, project. You're going to kind of have an entry point that uh, is particular to a given group. So again, leaving the process socially grounded uh, but open is extremely important. I hope to see the future of these projects and to be able to, uh, re again, reflect on them because both of them are works in progress, but I hope we can also think through them together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hueda. I'm sorry for having, um, uh, I mean, accelerated the presentation. No it was really very rich, and I think it, it provided us with, at least for me, with a lot of food, of thought, food for thought. Uh, but we have to keep the time uh, a little bit limited. And Mona, I'll, I'll ask you if you can keep it uh, to 12 minutes or 15 minutes to the maximum, if we uh, want to leave a, a space for debate after that. Thank you. Mona Harab, the other uh, champion of the Beirut Urban Lab, uh, on um, the concept of failed state that we hear much about. And, uh, everyone okay so I'm uh, speaking today as a as the social scientist in the Beirut urban lab I'm um, just to um, position a little bit my intervention as someone who uh, tries to critically reflect on processes of planning and design rather than um, than um, elaborate them and implement them. So uh, my positioning comes really to inform the practice of planning and design and uh, make designers and planners uh, more aware of the political economy framing and the power structures and the power configurations within which they operate in a, an attempt to inform better their design and planning policies so they actually uh, operate more effectively. In, a, in an environment that is uh, quite structured by polit politics and um, economic uh, dimensions. So um, my presentation today will uh, go over that framing and how uh, I approach it, the questions that I raise, and that I try to approach uh, planning and design issues or more generally urban initiatives and urban programs from. And I'll focus in the second part of the presentation on the current interrogations uh, I'm exploring with colleagues at the lab and outside of the lab. So this is really a question that's more of a provocation about who governs planning in failed states. I won't have the time to really debunk what is a failed state or not, but uh, I would be happy to think with you uh, about it later. Okay, so uh, in the context of post-colonial states where public institutions are hollowed out and used to capture and extract rent for private gains, I ask who governs cities and regions and how. 
what is governed and not governed, when and for what ends. What tools and strategies are used to justify and operationalize actions? What networks of actors are privileged or excluded? And I built on that on series of works, mostly by uh, French scholars who think about political sociology of planning. Uh, so these questions have been guiding my research agenda since I started my work on uh, the city of Beirut uh, in my master's studies, mainly interrogating the dialectic relationships and connections between cities and politics. So more specifically, I ask how do institutions and governance processes responsible for the elaboration and implementation of urban policies and programs variably affect people's lives and the built and natural environments? Why are these effects significantly territorialized and unequal? And how can urban and regional governance be conceived along more just, inclusive, and viable principles and modalities? Thank you, Ramadan. So simultaneously to these uh, questions that focus on actors and institutions, I'm also very keen on, ex on investigating how urban policies and programs are experienced, negotiated, and contested by ordinary dwellers under which conditions more generally do mobilization and collective action emerge, if at all. So I, I became quite keen on documenting these instances where against many odds, and God knows how many there are these days, people still find ways to challenge rulers over matters related to their urban livelihoods and lifestyles and manage to elude, navigate, or repel constraining structures and norms, even if fleetingly building on the work of uh, Julie-Anne Boudreau, Lale Khalili, and Abdel Malik Simon, among others. So this urge to document these occurrences of um, a quite inspiring human agency amidst the very afflicted state of the world is linked to my commitment and that of my colleagues at the lab to try to improve that world or indicate avenues for their, its improvement, if not through anti-politics, through what Ghassan Haj calls alter politics. So a few words on how I've been doing that uh, over the years, just to place it in a larger reflection on, um, on um, governance and planning and uh, politics. So in Leisurely Islam, when I uh, wrote that book with Lara Deeb, we showed how amidst the hegemonic structures of the Islamic milieu, some young women and men pushed the boundaries of pious morality, making claims on the city's leisure places and urban streets to accommodate a wider diversity of norms. Uh, when I, we wrote uh, Local Governments and Public Goods with Sami Atallah, or when we edited that volume with a lot of other colleagues, we examined how several mayors in Beirut, and in Lebanon more generally actually, were deploying innovative strategies and tactics to improve the built environment of their cities and towns and the lives of urban dwellers, despite excessive pushback from the central state and restrictive financial and administrative hurdles. Uh, in more recent years, my work on youth in Lebanon highlights how activists have been consistently and successfully mobilizing to advance significant issues in various spheres, especially urbanism and civil rights, notwithstanding significant impediments and policing that led many to disengage. My work there demonstrates how these mobilization foster interstitial op openings that enable seeds to grow, showcasing how the consistent efforts of urban activism can lead to relative successes, such as the scores garnered by Be Beirut Madinati during the municipal elections of 2016 and their spillover effects, the reopening of Hajj Beirut, the halting of several detrimental urban projects in Beirut, such as the Fuad Boutros Highway, the touristic resort in Delhi, and even beyond Beirut, such as the Bisri Dam. And of course, more recently, the uprisings of 2019, which incorporated impressive urban and spatial politics ingredients. At the lab, I also worked with the Wat Fanashdi and Ali Qasim on challenging the reductionist framing of Syrians as a burden on the city, and examined how some displaced Syrians contributed to city making and established their own businesses enriching street life and spatial practices. 
So across these many research projects, my analysis marries the f these four elements you can read on the slides. An analysis of actors, discourses, and representations of governance and spatial production. Particularly, I'm interested in how they legitimize and justify their action. Uh, a mapping of various types of actions and interventions and their geographic variations, or what we call territorialities. The exploration of actors' organization into collectives and or multiscalar networks, and the political exchanges that determine these assemblages and their variations, and the study of ways in which dwellers navigate and contest unjust and unviable urban policies, public goods, or urban sp services provision. More recently at the lab, my work has been investigating the actors and governance processes of urban recovery in the aftermath of the Beirut port blast. So this is a collaborative work where we're partnering with researchers from the Policy Initiative, uh, which is a newly established think tank in Beirut, and the team includes Sami Atallah, Hussein Shaito, and Sami Zreb from the TPI, and Sophie Blameke, Luna Dayer, and myself from the BUL. So more specifically, in this, in, in this um, project, we interrogate the, ro the role of the Lebanese failed state and the political system. So as you know, all of you, I think by now, this is not really the first post-reconstruction recovery of Lebanon, but this time, this is a recovery that is not championed by a billionaire prime minister like Rafi Hariri that is able to attract transnational capital flows to the country, nor it is led by a powerful political sectarian party like Hezbollah dominating the, its strongholds and imposing its authority over reconstruction. This time, we have a recovery happening in the aftermath of uprisings that swept the country demanding for the fall of oligarchs in the aftermath of a criminal blast that furthered the delegitimization of the state and in the aftermath of interlocking crises that have aggravated the dysfunctions of the state apparatus. Additionally, this time, when international aid came, came again to the rescue, the donors are not as keen as they used to be to provide a lifeline to the state, given the very unaccommodating geopolitical context we're in. So amidst all this complexity, we have a range of actors that responded to the blast at the international, national, and local scales. We have international organizations, UN agencies, the World Bank, the European Union. We have the Lebanese army through the forward emergency room. We have public agencies, many sector ministries, the Higher Relief Council in the, at least the first phase of the, of the blast, of the post-blast period. We have the Beirut governorate and the municipality, as well as political sectarian actors, religious actors, diasporic actors, faith-based organizations, INGOs, NGOs, and civil society organizations. So the BULTPI study on actors and governance is articulated along two tracks. Our tools of investigation uh, rely on mixed methods. So we use primary data from a survey questionnaire we are compiling currently uh, from key informant inv interviews that we will be um, conducting, from participant observation that has started already, and from mapping and uh, from mapping that we will be developing with Ahmad Garbiye and the team at the lab, and from secondary data from the desk reviews we've been conducting. So the first track, as you can read here, is a track that explores the 3RF, the Recovery Reconstruction Reform Framework that has been put in place for Lebanon and its associated Lebanon financing fa facility, which is the trust fund that concentrates all, all the funding that comes to the country now. And this, is a, uh, this has been established by a consortium formed by the World Bank, UN agencies, and the EU. So this follows the new aid architecture for fragile context that takes the shape of what Papoudilis calls country platforms that are praised as models that should facilitate a more coordinated, adaptive, scalable, and context-specific approach to aid delivery. Lebanon's 3RF is particularly distinguished by its institutionalization of CSO's engagement through the establishment of a consultative group that includes 15 CSO's, civil society organizations, and BUL has a seat on this consultative group that allows it to follow the process and to, to lobby for its, uh, uh, for its, I mean, to advocate for its, uh, uh, 
for the programs that it wants to advance and to also observe how it's, the negotiations are happening within the 3RF. Uh, the second track we're working on is a mapping track where we map the actions and interventions of the multiple actors I mentioned earlier at the neighborhood scale, specifically in the areas affected by the blast. And here a preliminary uh, set of finding that based on a, on a review of uh, 135 actors reveals that almost 40% of these actors are religious, political, or sectarian, and these in include uh, 26% of FBOs, faith-based organization, while the other two-thirds are non-sectarian. So we have a series of hypotheses that, um, uh, around which each track is articulated. This is the set of hypotheses for the first track. Mainly we're, uh, we're exploring how the 3RF structure includes these adaptive and effective institutional arrangements that may be disrupting path dependency and, um, and amplify opportunities to lobby for reforms through this consultative group I mentioned. But we're also uh, noticing already that the 3RF is consolidating the existing CSO's fragmentation, providing insufficient modalities for accountability, and um, enabling some, although it is enabling some of these CSOs to work collectively towards some of the reforms. I don't have time to de uh, develop this, but uh, we can discuss it in the Q&A. So this is a track uh, that is uh, mainly uh, being elaborated through the work of Sophie Blomecki, who's here, uh, in her master's thesis, which is hopefully being defended soon, so you're also invited to attend it in due time. And uh, we're uh, going to develop further these questions with the TPI over summer and uh, next fall. Namely, we're quite interested in that third point, which has not really started to be explored yet. How is the 3RF negatively affecting the process of state building in Lebanon? Again, it's a hypothesis that we hope we can disprove, but for the time being, it's not being, it's not being disproved. Uh, track two hypothesis is a hypothesis we started exploring with Luna Dayek at the lab, um, uh, which I also take the opportunity to thank for her uh, support here and for the very hard work she's been doing in this track. So here the hypothesis uh, starts with, a, uh, with an idea that is quite well known in the development literature, how the aid industry is self-serving and how very, a lit very little proportion of resources that are being dispersed to Lebanon will actually reach beneficiaries or have actually reached beneficiaries. This is, uh, there's a lot of literature around this. I'm not going to share it with you. Just to say that we're quite aware of it. We're not going to dwell on this hypothesis too much, but we have enough data to confirm it. The second and the third are the hypotheses we're more interested in exploring with TPI, and they uh, approach this idea about low value and high value goods and the literature on clientelism and this idea that uh, uh, this um, reconstruction uh, phase might be strengthening or is pretty much strengthening the sectarian political actors in Lebanon and helping the authoritarian corrupt clientelistic regime of Lebanon to prolong its lifeline like we've seen elsewhere. And again here the, the literature on this uh, demonstrates that uh, there is a prolongation of the life of such states uh, especially uh, after disasters because the resources that come to, to support the state after a disaster gets captured by these political elites and their networks, especially in times of elections. So we, again, it's, it is the perfect storm that Mona mentioned earlier. Uh, it continues. So, uh, so namely through this work, what we want to do is to highlight uh, the risks of the 3RF to become a monolithic, top-heavy institutional structure that is uh, centered on donors' interest at the expense of public agents who are championing the public interest. And there are, there are a few left that we are trying to support and empower. So we're concerned that the structure would be divorced from people's needs on the grounds, especially the most vulnerable ones among them, and that would, it would be giving too much space to INGOs, NGOs, and CSOs that are certainly needed, but we, uh, it's essential that these um, set of actors do not dominate and operate in uncoordinated ways without an integrated and urban-based vision for recovery. 
So this is mainly what we've been warning against as members of the 3RF consultative group and actively lobbying and advocating for trying to find creative ways to set in place an effective, redistributive, people-centered, and most importantly, accountable institutional setup within existing public structures. So we have been attempting to push for the establishment of a planning unit, an agence urbaine within the governorate of, the, of Beirut. Um, and uh, we, we, wanted that, we want that unit to be responsible to coordinate the work of all these CSOs and NGOs and to lead collaborative efforts toward the making of an urban strategy that would start off from the neighborhoods affected by the blast and that would build upon the various existing programs already developed for the municipality and paid for uh, by donors and by the uh, Lebanese people, such as the Plan Vert and the Plan de Développement Doux, mm -hmm. that is el elaborated by uh, Habib Debus' uh, Irby firm and um, its network of, of uh, urban designers and planners. And you will hear more about our ideas towards that strategy in panel three today. So I will stop with that and thank uh, all the team for their contribution and um, look forward to your questions and comments. And I give the floor to Ahmed. Thank you very much, Mona. Uh, always uh, frustrating to, to have so much limited time for such interesting uh, points, but uh, I'm sure that we'll have time maybe, Mona, to, uh, to prolong a little bit for, uh, for a Q&A session. Uh, Ahmad, uh, thank you. The floor is yours now you, on issues of uh, data mapping and data collection. Hi, is this good? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Muna, Muna, and Huayda. I'll try to keep it within my time limit. I know we've already exceeded the allocated time. Okay. <laughs> Central to our work at the Beirut Urban Lab is the. Get closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. That's better? Central to our work at the Beirut Urban Lab is the instrumental role mapping and data visualization play in really most projects. They are recognized as core components of the research methodology, vital tools for analyzing and representing urban phenomena, as well as tools for public engagement, advocacy, and in certain cases, a type of media activism. This design practice is by nature nestled within a cross-disciplinary space that bridges between multiple fields, urbanism, planning, social sciences, data science, cartography, geography, and of course, graphic design. Within this framework, we advocate for a mapping practice that doesn't only focus on outputs to communicate research findings, but one that forms an essential constituent of the research process itself interpreting and visualizing urban data while actively intervening in the methods of collecting, processing, and analyzing it, all the while reflecting critically on the politics of its representation. This relationship between mapping and research, or mapping as research, has been cultivated within this collaborative group um, for over 10 years before the official institutionalization of the Urban Lab in 2018. I am going to do this and do a little uh, trip um, back memory lane. Um, I'm not going to dwell on these projects, but I feel that they're really important to where we come from. Um, and also another reason, so this is, of course, the 2006 mapping of the Israeli assault on Lebanon, um, a page from the reconstruction of Hartahrek uh, book. 
uh, our previous work on militarization of space in Beirut, uh, public space, this is uh, inhabiting the street, um, policing the street, territorializing the street where we read all kinds of sectarian and political visual markers. Uh, and of course, our work on uh, um, refugee city making, uh, where we mapped homemaking practices in Jaitawi, and this really elaborate and rich project that deals with the mobilities um, and uh, practices of delivery drivers, of food delivery drivers. So the reason why I gave you this kind of quick snapshot of previous work is twofold. One is, like I said, to talk about where we came from. Um, and all of these projects have been collaborative, where uh, different people, including, of course, Muna, Muna, Huwaida, and other people in the lab uh, have worked on. But th the other reason is uh, also to perhaps present a little bit of a um, let's say a slippage or a difference or a shift of our work pre-GIS and post-GIS. This is the designer in me speaking and uh, uh, maybe these points or this, this distinction will be made clearer throughout the presentation, at least I hope so. So today I want to talk more specifically about our collective research work as a lab. Briefly, uh, of course, since most projects will be presented later by my fellow labbers in more detail, I will focus on the context in which we operate Beirut, Lebanon, as a site of seemingly perpetual crises, one of which is an incessant crisis of data. The mapping tools we use to address that and some of the visualization approaches we adopt as we try and engage critically with both the local conditions we study and the global technologies we utilize. Before I get into it, I'd like to give a Quick shout out to our GIS and data visualization team, Sharif Tarhini, Shaza Jazzar, Jawad Shaib, Noor Zoghbi Faris, Smail Hatet, and more recently, Monica Baspous and Hayes Buchanan. They are truly the backbone of the mapping war work uh, we produce at the lab. Okay, so Lebanon is plagued by the six scarcity, secrecy, and neglect of data in both its raw and visualized forms. I would like to just stop here for a second and explain a little bit what's the difference between these three terms. Obviously, the scarcity of data is when data does not exist at all. Secrecy of data is when data exists and is not shared. Notoriously, the army has um, a lot of data on the built environment, not only in Beirut, but Lebanon. Um, and of course is not eager to share it like most military uh, organizations and institutions. And data neglect is a sad fact where data sometimes exists but in forms that are very difficult to process. Not, not well filed, not well archived, not well uh, named. Um, so just to show that this kind of problem with data in Lebanon is multifold. What is important to keep in mind is that like in many places I'm sure something uh, seemingly as straightforward as an open georeference detailed and reliable base map is hard to come by, let alone the data sets that can begin to populate it. It is certainly the case here that such digital artifacts are both urgent and precious. The Lebanese state discloses little to no information about its public sector, which is increasingly seen as non-transparent and irredeemably broken amid the unprecedented current political and financial crisis. This lack of public data in accessible formats is becoming a kind of a hallmark of its corrupt status quo. Worthy of note here is that a national census has not been conducted in Lebanon since 1932. The interrogation of GIS technologies for the mapping, analysis, and visualization of multiple data sets and the utilization of such digital platforms for the publishing and communication of research findings represented an important progression in our research work and agenda with the founding of the Beirut Urban Lab. Within this growing and increasingly crucial practice of digital geography, our mapping and visualization approaches had to adapt to new systems with the aim of making a wide collection of data sets about the city available to students, designers, academics, researchers, policymakers, activists, activists and the public at large in an increasingly accessible and navigable visualized form. The Beirut Built Environment Database was our flagship project aimed at filling some of these gaps, making a dent, let's say, in this prevalent lack of data. 
It is a public geoportal with multi-sectoral information about the built environment. I won't talk too much about it because, like I said, our, my colleagues would be uh, focusing on these projects um, in detail. It covers themes of development, housing, public space, public services, environmental conditions, among others, many uh, of which uh, many, of these, many of these data sets are fully downloadable as geo-referenced uh, data sets. The BBED story began with gaining access to a data set of building permits from the Order of Engineers and Architects covering the period between 1996 and 2018. Maybe I have that wrong because when I saw your dates that it slightly shifted. Um, now this was not a georeferenced data set by any means and it needed to be verified on the ground and supplemented with data collection that can support the many research questions we are interested in exploring. For that, a literal small army of field researchers had to be launched across the city, visiting every building in the list and creating classifactory systems and collecting a range of complementary information. Beirut is tiny, we know that, as far as surface area is concerned, which makes it more manageable uh, geographically in that regard. But these efforts confirm what we already know, that often in Lebanon, for d data to be had, data must be physically collected. We wanted to go beyond the mere inventory, of course, in this project. Our, our objective is that the data layers can serve as the thinking blocks for further research on the urban in Beirut, of course, we ourselves do that. Our uh, role was never confined to a data uh, repository. For the shareability of the data and its analytical potential, it had to be visualized with care. Representing numbers responsibly is important. As we know, that uh, generalized representations can be quite dangerous. This very telling snapshot of vacancy rates, for example, is as compelling as it can be misleading, if not explained properly. Uh, and we do that explaining across this platform as well as other uh, platforms that we produce. So what I'm talking about is the fact that we always have to remind the, the viewer that the uh, sample is limited. Maps tend to be believed on, on uh, face value, on surface value, um, and it's also important to remind that these neighborhood aggregations come from the preordained uh, official neighborhoods of Beirut, which don't really relate to the practiced, lived neighborhoods of Beirut, and at every step of the way, we have to uh, make these points very clear in order that the data does not project itself as some kind of objective truth. So other ways of avoiding this objective quantitative approach is to make efforts to produce visualizations that not only articulate a measure of the territory, but also make a statement about it. In this interpretation of the vacancy data, we resort to an inverted mapping of the city, a mapping of absence, if you will, which allows for an alarming image to come through where we see a small preview of what a vacant Beirut actually looks like. So, these are actually the vacancy rates, but that are erected, projected into buildings. We also take great care in visualizing data in intelligible form. We are mindful of how the layers overlay, tap into symbolic representations that are not arbitrary, and allow correlations between different data sets to emerge, even with the simple act of presenting them together. We also take time and space to explain our maps, methods, even the flaws, the absences, and the inaccuracies, as well as the ways the users can interact with the information through the geoportal. One of my personal favorite components of this platform is the research on water developed in collaboration with environmental engineer Ibrahim Um so I don't want to dwell too much into this. We don't have much time, but uh, data was collected on water quality, the presence of wells in different residential buildings, um, uh, water purchase uh, in different seasons, in the summer and the winter, water availability through uh, uh, the governmental water service. Um, and ultimately, this projection which, which we did on water availability in Beirut, in municipal Beirut, based on the sample that we had. So this is, a, for me, a creative way, an inventive way of using GIS, where we allowed our data to be, through the sample, 
uh, reflect or uh, propose uh, a municipal-wide uh, reading. Now, this is interesting because this is where the kind of um, work begins to represent not only numeric or dry data sets, but it's beginning to speak of a very specific environment that, it's, that is lived in a very particular way. Obviously here we're talking about water disparity, so we're talking about the lack of uh, equality when it comes to public services. Um, so we can call it um, the incompetence in managing public services, and definitely we can call it an environmental inequality across the city. But these statements are quite delicate. They can easily sway into tactics that are maybe close to propaganda, and we have to be very aware of that uh, in, in map making. What do I mean by that? Um, I can slap a title on this map that says, Christians are monopolizing Beirut's water. <laughs> but of course we don't. Now, this is a slightly serious part. This is true of all maps and mapping systems. They impose an alien classifactory order upon the human landscape and while silently pretending to merely observe and record, they intervene and participate in bringing the landscape into being. The operational efficacy in maps, coupled with the fact that they are generalized, scientific, and seem to present an expert, neutral point of view, instills in them the kind of credibility that allows their assumptions to pass unnoticed. It has been suggested that GIS represented a return to technocratic positivism. An interesting fact to keep in mind, I mean, we know that world map projections have been kind of the reference for this idea of, uh, of objectivity, uh, of, of a guise of objectivity, while perpetuating, um, you know, skewed representations of the world. Um, Mercator projection is, of course, uh, Eurocentric and extremely North privileged. But it's important to point out that there's something called a web Mercator, which is a variant of the Mercator map projection um, and is the de facto standard for web mapping applications. These include Google Maps, Mapbox, Esri, which is what we use, and even OpenStreetMap, which you know is a poster child for a people's cartography. So questions of open source um, um, software and open data are important, but we are not getting into this conversation right now. We also have to be aware of the digital divide, which consists of a disparity lag between different social groups by race, age, location, education. These tools need access to the internet. Um, they need bandwidth, lots of bandwidth. And then, of course, there's the question of language. Uh, they often come in English by default. It is tempting to think that newly developed and increasingly available map-making technologies at the center of which are GIS and digital visualization tools can provide some liberating possibilities. And the many synergies that open source GIS software in particular promotes between multiple types of mappers across the amateur professional spectrum is really an undeniable and serious challenge to the authoritative power historically associated with cartographic practice. Even though GIS, like all mapping systems, is not exempt from perpetuating what is already carved in cartographic convention. And its aesthetics of dispassionate computation further, reinforms, uh, re uh, further reinforce traps of Euclidean geometry, scientific epistemology, and the blind ethics of accuracy. Two minutes. But sometimes urgency can trump uh, some, if not all, of these traps. At no time was the sharing of data more poignant than in the aftermath of the blast on August 4, 2020, when a colossal explosion in Beirut, um, you've heard this many times, but we can't say it enough, killed uh, more than 200 people, injured thousands, and destroyed one third of the city. Until today, multiple international and local NGOs, syndicates, activists, civil society groups, and state actors involved in damage assessment and recovery of the devastated areas are scrambling to collect, locate, process, consolidate, and analyze spatial data, which were made even more difficult under, difficult under the COVID-19 related restrictions on mobility. Shortly after the blast, the BBED-based map was shared directly with many parties, including the army, 
engaged on the ground and was made available for download to the larger public. As a unified reference between very different types of actors, it needed to adhere to the most common of cadastral denominators, from parcel number to the boundaries of administrative districts, which we like to contest, in order to play its interfacing role effectively. The Beirut Urban Observatory is a platform of geolocalized urban data informing ongoing post-blast recovery efforts and is the latest major under undertaking bringing together the interests of all of the lab's research leads under one umbrella with a projected plan over at least the coming three years. In the aftermath of the Beirut blast and the accumulating crises in Lebanon, it was necessary for the research team to invoke and adhere to bottom-up people-centered approaches to recovery at multiple scales, and my colleagues uh, spoke about this um, in the previous three sessions. Um, sorry. And to address a variety of themes such as damage assessment, green spaces, open spaces, community support projects, socioeconomic profiles of different neighborhoods, and a monitoring of commercial and residential return to the affected areas. And you will hear members of the lab go deeply into each one of these projects um, later in the day. Some strategies included visualizations at multiple scales and preserving anonymity for the lack of potential exploitation of the inhabitants and the conditions mapped. Note here how we included in the map of, uh, in the map, uh, of Carantina neighborhood divisions that are absent from the official map of Beirut and its default districts, themselves a given in most GIS platforms. These are instead the lived areas of Carantina as practiced and understood by its residents. Another tactic or, or method is a faith in small data. In-depth analysis of multiple variables on a cluster level, such as in this case of an output focusing on the area affected by the Fuad Butros Highway, which also will be discussed today. Other methods of data collection worth mentioning are, um, sorry, other methods of data collection are worth mentioning. For this research on COVID-19 governance, uh, scanning media outlets proved a very useful uh, um, methodology. This project will also be presented later, but I wanted to highlight it as an example which during the early COVID period that was rife with dashboards and other types of charts and visualized data on infections and spread, inserted itself in a media landscape and provided a new lens to look at the pandemic tracing local governance that reinforces political sectarian territor territorialization. It is in this sense that we sometimes speak of these projects as media activism projects. Public scholarship has always been a core component of our research work. And with the above mentioned geoportals and projects, this level of service to the design and research communities, the city and the public took on a larger scope with major implications. Underpinning all this is an interest in exposing and subverting the institutional power and, politics and political bias embedded in maps and inherent to historical, cartographic, and map-making traditions, as well as advancing knowledge production about urban conditions in the Beirut-Lebanon context and promoting a socially aware design practice and an approach to urban research that strives for healthier, more equitable, more viable, and ultimately more just cities. A little bit of thinking ahead. We have already plans to expand the BBED. Uh, it's actually in the making right now. Our initial data set just doubled. So this is very exciting. So we need, you know, we, we, are, we are about to send yet another army of uh, researchers on the field. Um, but we are, have always been thinking about getting out of Beirut. This is something that is important for us and hopefully it will be happening. Other cities, not just you know, not just expand uh, um, to the suburban areas of uh, the capital. Um, and uh, also engaging in maybe user-fed or citizen-fed uh, data. Um, um, Abir from the Urban Lab will talk about a project that uh, uses this method today. And lastly, publishing in Arabic, which is very important for us and we do uh, quite frequently 
but not yet on the level of these public geo portals. And I'm happy to report, and this is a kind of a, a teaser, that the Beirut Environment Data Database is currently being fully translated uh, uh, into Arabic by our wonderful translator, Zena. And with that, I end my talk, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, I will invite the four speakers to um, come on stage, please. Uh, we'll, have, we'll try to have a discussion or uh, at least a few questions and answers. Uh, Monet? Can you scoot over? Okay, we're uh, in fact running out of time because we're already off limits and I'll, uh, I'll, I got the permission uh, from the, the organizers to extend a little bit. Um, and also I have another task since uh, Lina Abu Habib, our colleague from the Asfari Institute, was supposed to <coughs> to be a discussant in this, uh, on this panel, and uh, she had to apologize for reasons, uh, for personal reasons, and I am replacing her, so I'll, I'll try to, uh, not to take too much time, but uh, in fact, my appetite was, was really wet by uh, what I've heard uh, this morning, and I, uh, I will try to um, very quickly um, uh, draw certain commonalities from the four presentations, uh, very exciting presentations that we have heard. And, and to try to uh, take some uh, or to highlight some takeaways from these uh, with uh, the lens that I, uh, I wear as, as a political scientist and a policy, uh, let's say, analyst, uh, and, and to try to, to draw the lessons in terms of policy, uh, policy analysis. Uh, of the four presentations, uh, of course, unequally, but uh, the first question that, that is interesting for me, the first issue is, is uh, the issue of sequencing, the, the time frame and the timeline. Uh, usually, I mean, the, this is the ideal model, or at least the theoretical model. We tend to think of uh, reconstruction and planning as being something coming after uh, a crisis. It's a post-crisis, post-war, post-earthquake, post-etc. Uh, process. Uh, however, and I think uh, you, Mona, and, and also Mona Fawaz, you highlighted how much this process is coming during the, the process of collapse. The planning and reconstruction is now taking place during the, the situation of, of destruction, in fact, economic destruction, physical destruction, political destruction, moral destruction. So this is a, a rare case, and I think it's already an interesting point to, to reflect upon. Uh, because the crisis is a protracted <coughs> one, so reconstruction cannot wait, planning cannot wait, it has to occur uh, within the, 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 the dynamics of destruction. And here we have uh, the issue of the constraints that we have, uh, that other presentations like, for example, Ahmad's or um, uh, Huayda has, has highlighted, the, the, the constraints and the impediments and the limits, uh, uh, plus the dangers, the, the dangers that were uh, mentioned by Huayda, the danger of impatience, for example, uh, and the danger of, uh, of backlash, the backlash of prolonging uh, the crisis by giving an uh, additional lifeline uh, to the rotten, let's say, political system, public, uh, public environment that is in fact uh, dying or uh, at least agonizing without uh, essentially dying. Uh, the question of limitation was the second issue that was, I think, very important in, in the four presentations that we have heard. Uh, and it was interesting for me. Uh, you are working under constraint, in fact. And this is for us policy analysts, economists, etc., policy makers, is a very classical uh, case, in fact. You constantly work under, uh, under constraints and limitations. Here, uh, the limitations are a bit different, but you can also find some commonalities. You have a scarcity or a lack or a limitation of data. Uh, the, the last presentation by Ahmad uh, of knowledge resource. You don't exactly know what is the environment you're working in, what you have at hand in terms of, uh, of raw data, of evidence. And this is a, 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 a crucial limitation, a crucial uh, impediment. The second one, uh, I think you highlighted it, and others also, and Huayda, is the lack or the, the, the lack or the deficit of public awareness. 
uh, that, uh, that in fact is sometimes uh, what drives um, projects to shy away from the human and heritage uh, focused approach because there's no enough, there's not enough uh, public awareness, not to mention public mobilization mm -hmm. about the processes and, and the projects. And then you have, and this is where uh, I think Mona uh, Harub was, was very eloquent, the lack of policy tools, of proper policy tools, uh, because we are in a failed state, because uh, we don't have the proper uh, administrative, political, institutional, etc., legal uh, environment and framework, so we are also in a vacuum of, of policy tools. Uh, this leads me to my third point, and I'll stop there. Uh, one way to cope with this, and this is where the, the policy, if you want, or, or yeah, the IFI hat comes to, 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 to the urban lab uh, uh, issue, uh, one way to cope with that is to, um, and since we are talking here about reconstruction and spaces, I'm, I'm not trying to play on words, but the, to cope with that, we have the necessity probably to recreate a kind of policy space about the urban issue about the urban question, and this is what we, we uh, very often discuss, uh, I mean, uh, the two of us, I mean, IFI and, and the Urban Lab. Uh, and the policy space is by itself recreating the policy community and the policy debate about the urban issue, the urban question, is a, a way probably to re-inject some, uh, at least some uh, elements of legitimacy in the debate. And, uh, and, and of public awareness. And the public space, uh, the policy space about or around the, the reconstruction issue, uh, uh, exactly as you all mentioned, uh, has to bring on board uh, a different set of actors and a diversified set of actors and stakeholders uh, behind, uh, be, uh, besides and probably above the state uh, itself. Uh, you mentioned, some of you mentioned the, the private sector, developers, the financial sector, etc. Experts and academicians, I mean the academic community, not only the expert community in terms of, of know-how, but the people who are uh, uh, exactly able to inject or re-inject anthropology, economics, uh, social sciences, sociology, etc to these approaches and, and, and uh, add to the technicality of, of the process. So it's a very complex plur pluridisciplinary uh, approach. Uh, the third stakeholder, which also was mentioned, which is very important, is the public opinion, NGOs, media, etc., that will create this, uh, this awareness uh, uh, dynamics and socialize uh, the debate about the urban issues. Uh, and then last but not least, of course, and I think uh, someone mentioned it, uh, the international donors community, because also they are both the, the fuelers and the watchers of, 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 this, uh, of this process. So as uh, Huayda Harisi said, and I'll conclude on that, um, the, all this is, is highlighting once more uh, the necessity of re-injecting or reinserting a dose of bottom-up, uh, let's say, approach or dynamic in, in, in in everything urban, and this is exactly what is aimed by uh, the recreation of this policy space uh, around the, the public, the, the, the urban planning issue. I'll stop here. I, I'm sure that a lot of people have a lot of questions. Uh, we'll have to stop, I think, at 12. So we have 15 minutes. Uh, I urge you to be brief in your question. Uh, just introduce yourself quickly, and the responders also will try to be as brief as possible. I mean, it's too little after these, you know, these interventions. It's, re it's, it's a little bit frustrating if we can have more time. Just I would like to, to bring forward uh, two dualities that the first one is between planning and time. And most of the, you know, planning presupposes time. We plan for the future. And most, uh, you know, what we are now engaged is to act immediately when we say tactical. Tactical means that we are, it's not about planning, it's about acting immediately. So I think there is, when we are in emergency situation, planning is not the right term. It should be probably urbanism rather than planning. That's just a thought that, you know, 
came to my mind. The, the, the second also is tied to, the, to this first planning and time, okay? It's research and action. Okay, so how far this, this uh, I think you know what Hoida presented us with is a very interesting bridge between, uh, you know, making, uh, bridging this gap between research and actions in emergency situations. Uh, just these are remarks, but my, my you know, my last uh, thought is about how to bypass a failing state when we are dealing with crisis urbanism, okay? Uh, what are the mechanisms to bypass the state? So. This, is, uh, this is a very wide question. I, I would say maybe later on Mona will, will take on, on that. Let, let's take uh, a few other questions and, and then we'll try to group the answers. Hello, everyone. Dana Shibli. Hi. Um, my question actually is regarding, like, starting with the heritage, um, what you presented, Hawaii, and also it has to do with the state and the development, the urban planning. It's, a, it's kind of tied together. So what are your plans? Um, how, do you see, how do you see the development of these? Are you going to, how do you envision them? Are you going to like uh, develop them in the same way, or do you plan on sustainable urban development? Like when we talk about uh, the future, uh, we talk about the sustainability. Um, like we've been hearing about sustainable um, in all, in everywhere. They talk about the carbon emissions and everything, and they talk about the cities of the future. When they talk about this, they say like the cities have to move upwards and stuff. So I think like they're tied together. There are a lot of papers that say like when they design, they want to design upwards. And they talk sometimes, even with the urban heritage, they say like they want to bring the, like they, we, we, we renovate these buildings and we bring them into the future. Do you think like you want to do that? You want to design them just the way they were or you want to bring them up into the future, maybe there are a lot of examples in Europe where they design the external part and they move them, they bring them to, into the 21st century. Um, I've, read, I've seen a lot of presentations in the USA and they've been uh, talking about like changing the norm and changing the, uh, I think the building law, they want to forbid uh, single housing projects because they think this is the problem of carbon emissions and stuff. They think like they, they should stop building these houses because cities, uh, they should, uh, let me think about it. We should stop uh, building on uh, farmlands and stuff. We should stop using, um, we should, we, we should uh, build more inside the cities and develop more the cities. This is the way because this is why I'm asking about these uh, how do we envision reconstructing our, our cities? So are we, are we thinking about the sustainable factor? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would you? Um, I'm happy to. Yeah, please. I mean, I'll, I'll make a few comments just really quickly on uh, the stuff we heard. Um, I, I really love the question about future. Robert, I think this is spot on exactly where our problem is, that planning is future oriented and that it's projecting into a future of collective being together when we are saying we, we don't see the future, but we also have said a lot we don't have a state. What we're not talking about enough is that we don't also have collectivities. We don't have a we. So, I mean, let's be really honest. We're a divided, sectarian, uh, scattered society. And so for me, uh, the point of talking about tactical is not to just think about the garden that you're going to do together. I'm using tactical deliberately as a strategy to think about working experience, people working, experiencing things together so that there is a commitment towards shared images, shared ways of being together that people begin to commit to. And we really begin in the policy space of, uh, uh, of Joe, 
of professionals actually changing the ethos of what it means to be a planner. And a lot of the work that has been happening at the Urban Lab in creating these shared debates, and before that also at the Order of Engineers with Jad, it's all about shifting the ethos, the planning doctrine about what is right, creating a commitment that at least as professionals, we have a shared body of values that we're going to work towards. And that can really has to be understood in a context where we're not doing advocacy. So don't think of it as like the plans we're doing, the coast, the public space is about advocacy. Because this, the guy in front of you does not exist. You're not in the US. Instead, you're doing these plans to enact a different reality towards system change. What you're, and, and that's really why we're reinventing planning as one of the conduits for system change. And that's how I see it, at least. So it's, it's, and that's why I call it profoundly political. It's about recovering who can be the custodian, who are we planning for, who is this collective. So we're building the pieces of that. And of course, it's super experimental. It, we don't have a recipe. We have some hope that at some point in Spain, some planners in Barcelona did try that. It's not one-to-one. -one. Of course, they had Europe behind them, and we're not. We, <laughs> we live on a volcano. But there are elements of these experiences that we can still appeal to. So that's, and I'd love to take this on after. I don't want to take this space. But I think it's a very important question. Thanks. OK, uh, maybe uh, Huaydo, yeah? yeah. Yes, I'd like to just pick up from where Mona um, stopped uh, and answer the two questions. One is, you know, it, Yes, in a failed state, in a post-disaster condition, what do we do? I think the, the two projects that I showed uh, show um, an, an, an interesting experimentation that we had uh, to work as you know single actors of a consortium. So in the Carantina project, I always was saying to all the people who were involved that, look, we have a, an interesting experiment where we work with the municipality, with NGOs I, I, and INGOs, with the people and with BUL as an academic sort of driver. So uh, if we work together uh, as a collective uh, from different dimensions, I think we can uh, come up with an alternative temporary solution. Also with the UNESCO project, it was um, also a project where DGA was the beneficiary. We constantly met with them. We took their data, built on it, validated it, gave them new data. So it was DGA from the government, uh, UNESCO as funding agency, BUL, but we also worked extensively with the people who live in these sites. With, through the urban walks, through the interviews, the data collection. So I think if we always create this four-legged kind of you know, network of um, actors, we can propose an alternative modality of getting things done. They may not be things that are in the long-term um, uh, realm, but they may be entry points to building um, onto that. So this is at least to answer, Robert, what we were doing with these uh, planning or, or urban projects. To answer Dana, um, I uh, really kind of try to, to refuse this polarity between you know, going back to what was there in a restoration or rebuilding something new to match the, the new age. Uh, I think there is a lot in between, and the decision is not really ours. I've learned to kind of reduce myself to a facilitator uh, and buy completely into this notion that you know heritage is a social construct, especially in sites of living heritage, like Jemaize, Tripoli, um, uh, Saida, places where we are operating. The blast hit areas of living heritage. People were living there, right? Uh, practicing uh, their everydayness, and that's part of the heritage. So for me, sustainability there is how do you sustain those practices, inclusive of the built and landscape environment where they live. And again, it's about reconnecting people to place. So it's n the question that you pose to me, do I want to restore it or do I want to? I, I think um, is a question that we should go beyond and kind of work with the people to ask them that. The third project that I didn't present that I hope you will hear a little bit about is called Unarchiving the City and Imagining the Future. Um, it's a project that is with the University of Exeter and um, uh, funded by uh, GRCP. And 
I think these are questions that we work together with the people on the ground because heritage for me is about moral and even financial ownership of a place by a community. Um, so we have to recognize that. We, we cannot come to you with prepackaged answers about what should be done. It's really, I mean, a position that we were trying to say, that we go in and start from the bottom up first and try to answer these questions with the people, hypothesize, as Muna showed, and then work towards a solution. So we don't come with these prepackaged solutions. We learn a lot along the way. Uh, it, on these projects just as much as we give them as experts. So I hope I answered you. It's a collaborative thing, and probably because we're in the 21st century, maybe they might need more, at least maybe two floors more. It's at least like we, we're not going to return it to like 100 years back. This is what I'm trying to say because maybe they, they have needs at this point. That's it. Thank you. Maybe, maybe this debate will, will continue after the break. Uh, <laughs> we still have three minutes for if Ahmed wants to say something on, on one of the topics. If not, okay. Mona, uh, a few words on the issue of how to how to bypass the, the failing state or the failed states, and then uh, we'll have to conclude, unfortunately. I felt it was very uh, largely answered by Mona's reply. I don't think there's a recipe here that we need. We want to bypass the state. On the on the contrary, I think it's the it's a paradox, and you integrated that paradox that it's a, there's a very strong tension uh, where where we know that planning does not necessarily to be operating from within state institutions, but at the same time, there, we are currently in an extreme position where the absence of a state institution coordinating the work is going to de be detrimental to the, to, to the public welfare. So where you need a coordinator, and that co coordinator needs to be a public agent because no one else has that prerogative. So how do you do that in on a context where you have a delegitimized public institution? This is really a very difficult question to have a, to provide an answer to. And for us, I think currently we're not we're not finding that we need to bypass public institutions. I think we're one of the very rare, rare voices that is asking for the process to be associated to the governorate of Beirut. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a demand that we've we've been pitching for the past year and a half with the three RF, and uh, it might seem paradoxical because the state is defunct, dysfunctional, corrupt. But the idea of that it needs to be housed in an institution that is that is a guarantor of the public interest that should be, and how we can reclaim that space. And I mean, in Lebanon, we know that public institutions are capturing public resources. It's a fact. I mean, who defends public resources in Lebanon? It's not the state. It's civil society organizations. It's been the case for years. So we live in that paradox where the public is defended not by, by public institutions, by people outside of public institutions. How do you think that is? I find it a very difficult intellectual question to answer, and it debunks totally all the theories of the state and society. So it's uh, very stimulating intellectually, but when you're living this as a citizen, as a dweller, as an activist, as a researcher, it poses, uh, I would say, very difficult questions on how to operate. But I think Mona answered that I'm totally aligned on what she did. We're experimenting with, with tools, and we start with an idea. In two months, we, ad we adjust it, we change it. We're always discussing how to adjust it. Uh, thank you, Mona. I, 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 if I may add, I think one also one way to to approach this is to also sometimes differentiate between the state, the political system, and the pu public administration that are not the same in Lebanon. Yeah, and absolutely. sometimes uh, trying to uh, topple one yeah. could undermine the other, while you need to reinforce it. So it's a very difficult yeah. conundrum. And uh, for us political scientists, it's something that is very, uh, very interesting to reflect on. This is a way for me to say that I was extremely happy to moderate this panel because it, it, it gave me uh, additional reasons to think that we, that we have to work together much more. Uh, and it's also a way to conclude this uh, very interesting panel and to thank you for the invitation. And uh, I, I'll, I'll ask you to join me and thank uh, this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.